five, six, test one. Are you happy with that, James? I think I, I can work with that. Yeah, that's good. You're good? Okay.
morning, beloved church family and friends of the Whitby Free Methodist Church. My name is Mike Carlton, and uh, whether you're joining us here in person or online, we extend a heartfelt welcome to you on this blessed Palm Sunday. To our first, uh, to any of our first-time visitors, uh, we're so glad you're here to share this special day. We hope that you find Today marks the beginning of Holy Week, a sacred time to reflect on the path of love, sacrifice, and victory that Jesus walked for us. Together, in unity and faith, let's commemorate Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem, a moment that set up the events of the most significant week in Christian history. Be sure to check out our website for more information on Holy Week's events and services and how you can be part of the, this community's Easter journey. As we celebrate Palm Sunday, let's turn our hearts and minds to scripture, drawing inspiration from the word of God. Today we reflect on Palm, uh, Psalm 118, verses 26 through 29, from the New T International Version, a passage that resonates with the spirit of Palm Sunday. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine upon us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we wave our palms and raise our voices in joyful praise, we remember the love and humility of Christ, our Savior, who entered Jerusalem to fulfill your will. Bless our gathering today and fill our hearts with the hope and promise of Easter. As we worship, let us draw closer to you, celebrating the victory over sin and death that Jesus secured for us. In his precious name we pray. Amen. Stand and join as we welcome God into our midst, just as they did on Palm Sunday. Hosanna in the highest. Amen. Thank you, Mike, for opening our service. Please do rise if and as you are able. And who can hear the din of the children screaming and praising? Let's welcome them in, too.
Okay, I'm going to ask the grown-ups to take their seats, and then, kids, thank you for helping us open our service with worship. There we go. And I have a special story that I wrote to help us think about what happened on Palm Sunday. Who would like to hear my story today? Okay, I see lots of hands. This story is called Petra the Pebble. And this is not Petra the Pebble, but I brought this rock in to help you think about what Petra the Pebble might have been like. So I'll just put that rock right there so that you have something to think about as we hear this story. It goes like this. Once there was a rock who lived on the side of a road that led into the city of Jerusalem. Her name was Petra, and she was not rough and strong like the other rocks. They had big, round bodies, and they had booming voices. But Petra was small and shy, and she hardly ever spoke up. And when she did, when she did speak up, it was just a tiny little peep like the sound a pebble makes when it falls to the ground. Now, the road that Petra lived beside happened to be the route that the humans used on special occasions when they were on their way into the city to worship. And on one very special occasion, the road was simply packed with travelers. You see, there was a big party happening called Passover, and all the people were coming from all over to celebrate at the party. Now, rocks live for a very long time, but even so, Petra has never forgotten what she saw that day, because a huge crowd was coming, and they were all waving palm branches in the air, and some of them were even taking off their coats and throwing them down on the ground to make sort of a carpet, like the red carpet that famous people walk on in Hollywood. And when Petra strained to see what all the fuss was about, she saw a sweet-looking donkey trotting along the road with his head held high. Although, when Petra saw who was riding that donkey, she saw right away why it was so happy, because on the donkey's back, and now this is hard for humans like us to understand, because we don't have exactly the same kind of relationship with God as the non-human things like rocks do. And so I can't exactly tell you how Petra knew this, but she did. On the back of that donkey was none other than God's son. The son of God, who was the king of the whole world. And not just the king, but also the creator. The one through whom God had made children and parents and donkeys and trees and even also rocks. Well, grown-ups sometimes have trouble recognizing him, but a rock like Petra could spot him a mile away. And so could the children, apparently, because there was a huge crowd of children there dancing around the donkey and singing, Hosanna to the Son of David, Hosanna to the King of God's creation. Well, Petra's little rocky heart felt like it was going to burst for joy when she saw them. But then she noticed a sad thing. There was a little girl there who was not singing like the other children. Now, she looked very nice. In fact, Petra thought that if she were a person or if that little girl were a rock, they would probably be very good friends. But she was not singing. She was just holding her mommy's hand and looking, actually, rather shy. Now, Petra knew that sometimes humans can be born with something that makes it so they can't talk. And when Petra looked closely at this little girl, it looked like that was true for her. Petra could tell that she wanted very much to sing like the other children, but she was not able to. Now, this made Petra sad, but she did not have time to think about it because just then, a very important-looking man stepped up to the donkey that was carrying God's son. Sir, he said, sir, do you see how these children are calling you the king of God's world? You'd better make them stop. You see, the man didn't believe that he was God's son. 
And because he didn't, he thought it was wrong for those children to praise him the way they were doing. Oh no, thought Petra. If all those children stop singing, then how will the humans know who it really is riding on the back of that donkey? Mind you, she didn't need to worry because the Son of God looked at that stern-looking man and he said, I'll tell you what, if these children don't do it, then even the stones themselves would cry out to praise me. Well, a great cheer went up from all the children. Can you give me a sample of what that sounded like? And they started to sing Hosanna again. All of them, of course, except for that little girl who had no voice. She just squeezed her mommy's hand and tucked in close beside her. But Petra had heard what the Son of God had said, and she knew exactly what to do. She tumbled down the hillside just to get just as close as she possibly could, and with all her might, she started shouting out with her pebbly little voice. Now, kids, this story is just pretend. Although it's not pretend that Jesus came riding on his donkey into the city that day, and it's not pretend what he said about the rocks praising him if the children didn't, but even so... I know that you know that rocks can't really talk and move the way Petra did. But I think one of the reasons Jesus said what he did about the stones crying out is so that we would know that he is the king of the whole creation, children and rocks included. And the whole creation, rocks and children alike, were made to give him glory. And if that makes sense, then maybe you and I can pretend just a little bit more as I finish my story. Because there was a lot of noise on the street that day. But if you listen very closely, everybody listen as closely as you can. If you listened closely, you probably would have heard one pebbly little voice, Petra's voice, shouting out as loud as she could on behalf of that little girl so that nobody would be left out. Hosanna! Hosanna! Hosanna to the king. And since we're pretending anyways, I like to think that that little girl heard it too. And it made her heart glad to the point of bursting because it was just exactly what she wanted to say to give Jesus the glory that he deserved. Amen? Okay. Guys, you take your palm branches with you and go back to your spots. And remember, today is a day about giving Jesus all the glory that he deserves. I'll put our rock to stand in as Petra right back up here. And on this next song, if you want to sing and praise with the grown-ups, you go right ahead. So go back to your spots. And grown-ups, I'll invite you to stand up as we continue to praise Jesus.
My sin was great, your love was great. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. Death could not hold you, the veil tore before you. You silence the boast of sin and grace. The heavens are roaring, praise of your glory. You were raised to life again. You have no rival, you have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the glory, come. Yours is the glory. Yours is the name above all names. What a beautiful name it is. The name. Jesus Christ, thy King. What a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. Amen, Lord. You truly are beautiful in our midst. You are powerful and wonderful. And we thank you for the way that the children have reminded us of that, the way your word has, and the way the presence of your spirit has. May we leave here with no doubt of the truth of the words we have sung. And together we offer you the praise that is your due. And all God's people said, Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Does everybody feel the energy today? It's kind of out of control, I love it. <laughs> which is probably what it was like that day when Jesus uh, was entering the city, so this is very appropriate. Hi, I'm Margot Carlton, and I'll be reading the scripture today from um, Philippians. This is the letter Paul wrote to the Philippians, thanking them for their support while he was imprisoned in Rome but also to encourage them as they too were facing a lot of opposition. So in chapter two, verses five through 11, he's encouraging them to be humble. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. 
Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee, every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and on under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. May you also be encouraged by these words today. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, Margo, for leading us in our scripture reading this morning. Thank you to the musicians for leading us in praise. And children, thank you for the special part you have played. If you want now, you can be dismissed for your Sunday school classes. You all can meet Ms. Emily. And uh, Chloe and Ava, would you mind helping me? As the kids came in, a lot of these blankets got a little bunched up, and I'm afraid of people tripping. So if you all picked up one or two on your way out, it would probably make it safer for people as they come through. That would be wonderful. Thank you so much. And while the children are being dismissed for their Sunday school classes, so kids, take one of the grown-ups that brought you and meet uh, Miss Emily in the foyer. While that is happening, we have a uh, announcement video to update you as to all of the things that are taking place in the life of our church community in the coming days. I'm your host, Brooklyn Trevet. Welcome to our guests, Cheryl Parts, James Stapley, and Reverend Dr. Dale Harris. Dale, I understand you're a pastor of the church? That's correct. Then you'll be glad to know that our kind doors for space games are Ryan Time, Movie Classics, Broadway Musicals, Popular Speeches, Really Tough Theology Questions, and Church Announcements. Okay, I'm ready. Let's go with really tough theology questions for 1,000. This Latin word meaning, and also the sun, is a term used to describe a major theological difference between the Western and Eastern Orthodox churches, which eventually led to the Great Schism of 1054. <sighs> what is the filial quake? That's a good Shannon, you have a divorce. Um, I'll go with church announcements for 100. This is the time and date for the Monty Thursday service this Thursday, where we'll remember the Lord's last supper before the cross. Um, what is Wednesday at 1 a.m.? I'm sorry, that's incorrect. Anyone else? What is Thursday, March 28th at 6.30? Yes, that's correct. You have the board, James. Oh. I'm going to go with really tough theology questions for 800. Mm. This Greek word, meaning empty, is used to describe the teaching that the Son of God was emptied of his divine glory when he became incarnate as the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh. What is the kenosis? That's correct. Um, I'll go with church announcements for 800. This is the date and time for our Good Friday service. What is Monday at 4 in the afternoon? I'm sorry, Shasta Dale. That's incorrect. Anyone else? What is Friday, March 29th, 10 in the morning? That's correct. You have the board. Good job. How about really tough theology for 600? This is a term for the Eastern Orthodox Church's view of salvation which holds that our ultimate destiny is to become participants in the divine nature, which takes from a close reading of 2 Peter 1, 14. <laughs> what is theosis? That's correct. You have oh. um, I'll go with church announcements for 600. This is a time and date for our Easter morning breakfast. <laughs> what is 6 a.m.? I'm sorry, that's incorrect. Oh. Anyone else? What is Sunday morning, March 31st at 9 a.m.? That's correct, you have the board. How about really tough theology for 400? This was the doctrine that made John Wesley's theology especially controversial in his day. So he always claimed that if anyone could find a better term to describe a clear teaching of the scripture regarding our purpose to build the in Christ, he would change it. But until anyone could, you would go with this term instead. What is entire sanctification? That's correct. Um, okay, I'll go with church announcements for 400. 
This is a great sharing group that is starting on April 2nd at 2 p.m. here at the church. Oh, I know. Grief Share. It's our support group for those who are grieving the loss of a loved one to help them know that they're not alone on their journey of grief. I'm sorry, Pastor Dale. That's correct, but you didn't give your answer in the form of the question. And that's all we have time for today. Please join us next week for another edition of Whippy FFC Jeopardy. Um, I forgot to say it in a question, but I will remind you that Grief Share is starting uh, mon Tuesday, April the 2nd, and Joyce McPherson, Leslie uh, Tice are leaders of that group. If you uh, are interested in participating, please do speak to them. Uh, if you've been through a, a recent grief in your life and uh, want to have support and help and know that you are not alone, this is a really great 13-week practical, but also just supportive community that will help you in that journey. I also want to remind you that uh, we do Coffee Connect at the last Sunday of every month. And so far, uh, Emily and Cheryl have been sort of managing our Coffee Connect, but we want to share the fun and open that up for everybody in the church community to participate. So what we're asking is if... A household in our church could sign up to do Coffee Connect. It would mean bringing some snacks and getting, helping getting the coffee ready for after the service coffee refreshment time. Uh, we'd love you to sign up for one month and your household could take one month to prepare the Coffee Connect. There is a sign-up sheet on the table near the Keurig machine in the foyer. And if you want to put your name down there, go ahead. Or if you want to speak to Cheryl uh, for details, please do that as well. I think that is all of the announcements. And we are going to turn to the scriptures now. We have been reading a book of Ecclesiastes uh, through the Lent season, but with it being Palm Sunday, I thought we would be remiss if we didn't take some time to look at one of the gospel accounts of the triumphal entry. And so we're going to look at Mark chapter 11. We'll be reading verses 1 to 11. If you'd like to turn there now, please do. Mark 11, 1 to 11, and let's hear the word of the Lord together. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it, and, and we'll send it back here shortly. They went and found the colt outside in the street, tied at a, do at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their coats on the roads, while others spread branches that they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed behind shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Um, I was reading this week about some of the worst kept secret identities in superhero history. Now, I realize that is a very strange thing to research, but you might actually be surprised by the number of terrible secret identities there are in the superhero world. You take, for example, the secret identity of Ben Grimm, a.k.a. The Thing. No? Well, if you are up on your Marvel comics, you will know that The Thing is one of the founding members of the superhero team, the Fantastic Four. Uh, he was piloting an experimental rocket ship when he got caught in a storm of cosmic rays that gave him superpowers. Namely, his one superpower is his distinctive orange, rocky-looking skin. This is what The Thing looks like when he is out saving the day. 
Of course, when he's not fighting crime, he's just plain old Ben Grimm, right? Who looks like this. I mean, who would ever suspect that the rocky-skinned gentleman underneath that fedora is really the rocky-skinned superhero, the thing? Would you ever piece it together? But of course, the greatest terriblest secret identity would have to be Superman. You all know Superman, of course, because when Superman is not out foiling the nefarious schemes of Lex Luthor, Superman hides his true identity with the elaborate disguise of combing out his hair and putting on a pair of glasses to become the mild-mannered Clark Kent reporter at the Daily Planet. Now, I am not exactly sure how he has been able to fool the world for years with nothing more than a simple pair of glasses as his disguise, but I actually came across a website that was dedicated to theories on this question. Maybe he moves too fast for anyone to ever see what he really looks like. Or maybe one of his superpowers is the ability to shift the muscles of his face ever so subtly so that he looks like a completely different person. Or maybe the fact that he wears his underwear on the outside of his pants just distracts everybody so that they never get a good look at his face, right? You have seen a picture of Superman. You, you know what I'm talking about? Okay. I wondered if that joke would fly. But... I was not researching secret identities just out of idle curiosity this week. It was only because we are reading Mark's account of Palm Sunday this morning, right? Mark's account. And whatever else was happening that day when Jesus rode a symbolic donkey through the streets of Jerusalem, for Mark, this triumphal entry is really about Jesus going public with his, well, let's call it his secret identity, as the Messiah, as the, the Lord of God's people, I mean. That secret identity is being revealed publicly in this moment for everybody to see. And if he really is Lord, well, after this moment, if he really is Lord, there will be no more hiding it. Well, that certainly seems to be Mark's point anyway, Whippy Church. If Jesus is Lord, there is no more hiding it. Although in order for us to hear that point well, it might help if I took some time with the details of this story. Because all the stuff that is happening in this passage, the, the donkey ride, the palm branches, the cries of Hosanna. Now, it may not make a ton of sense to us some 2,000 years after the fact, but if you were a first century Jew standing on the streets of Jerusalem that day, you would have got the point loud and clear. Because remember... In Jesus' day, Israel was an occupied territory, right? They were, they were a conquered nation under the control of the Roman Empire. And remember, too, that Jesus is taking this symbolic parade at the start of the Jewish Passover, Passover feast, when Jerusalem would have been literally packed with pilgrims. Thousands of Jewish pilgrims, I mean from all over the Roman Empire, who had all come to Jerusalem that day to celebrate Passover. And that's when Jesus gets on a donkey and he rides through the gates of the city of Jerusalem in plain sight of them all. Well, just know that every detail of this parade has been carefully orchestrated to communicate one simple fact that Jesus is Lord, and as Lord, he has come to set his people free. Well, take the thing with the palm branches as just one example. You see, sometime around 166 BC, uh, about 200 years before Jesus, there was this Jewish leader named Maccabeus who had led Israel in a, a stunning military victory against a Greek emperor named Antioch Epiphanes, who was ruling them at the time. 
And who wants to guess what all the people waved in the city of Jerusalem, the people of Israel, I mean, when Maccabeus rode into the city in 200 BC after he had sent Antioch Epiphanes packing? Any guesses? Palm branches, just like they're doing for Jesus now. Palm branches were sort of Israel's version of the stars and stripes, let's call them. And that line that they're shouting there, the Hosanna, right? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Well, that line actually comes from a song in the Old Testament. It was the song that Mike read for us at the start of our service today, and it talks about how God is going to deliver his people from all of their enemies and establish them as a free nation. And this is the song that the people are singing as Jesus rides through the streets. And then there's the donkey. Well, just know that Jesus was not the first person ever to take an unexpected donkey ride through the streets of Jerusalem. There's, there's a place in the Old Testament, for instance, in a book called First Kings, where King David is about to die. And no one in the story, no one knows which one of his sons is going to become the king after him. And so King David calls together all of the leaders and he says, have my son Solomon ride my donkey through the city and then have the prophet anoint him as king over Israel. And then blow the trumpet and have all of the people shout, long live the king, the son of David. Well, anyone who can do math can add this stuff up. King Solomon took a royal donkey ride through the city of Jerusalem to prove to the people that he was the rightful king. And now Jesus rides into town on a donkey while the city of Jerusalem is writhing under the thumb of Roman occupation. He rides through the streets of Jerusalem on a donkey while everyone waves national symbols of deliverance in the air, singing the first century equivalent of Israel's national anthem. Have you guys figured out what Jesus' secret identity is yet? Well, everyone standing on the road that day, waving their revolutionary palm branches in the air, they think they had figured it out. He's the king. He's our deliverer. He is the Lord of God's people. And he is that, Whitby Church. He is that in a way that none of them saw coming. He is. But... Mark would just want us to add this, that if he is the Lord, there can be no more hiding it. Now, I keep using that phrase, the no more hiding it bit, because it helps us put our finger on something else that is happening in this passage here in Mark 11. And once you see it, it will hit you right where you live. Because, yes, Jesus is revealing his secret identity as the Lord of God's people in this moment, but the rest of the story is that this is the very first time he is going public or has gone public in the whole entire book of the Gospel of Mark. You see, if you spend enough time in Mark's gospel, like, like if you read it through from beginning to end, let's say, it won't be long before you start to notice something that, um, well, highfalutin Bible scholars like Cheryl Parks might call, might call the messianic secret. This is a thing that keeps happening over and over and over again in Mark, from chapter 1 consistently through to the end of chapter 10. And then it abruptly stops after the triumphal entry that we're reading today. It goes like this. Jesus does a miracle, let's say, or a healing maybe. And while everyone is standing there with their jaws on the floor at what they just saw, he says, look, don't tell anybody about it. Keep what you've seen secret today. In Mark 5, 43, just for instance, he raises a little girl from the dead. And then it says, quote, he gave strict orders not to let anyone know about what he had done. 
And then in Mark 7, 36, just as another example, he heals a deaf man. And then after he, ha- he has healed him, it says, Jesus commanded them not to tell anybody about the healing. And then again in Mark 8, 26, after he has healed a blind man, he sends him home. But as he does, he gives him these instructions. He says, do not go into the village and do not let anyone know what I have done today. Well, guys who spend a lot of time studying the gospel of Mark have scratched their heads a lot over this one. Why does Jesus keep telling people not to tell what they've seen or heard when it comes to his identity as our Messiah. For the record, my guess is that it has something to do with the, the counterintuitive nature of what it means to follow Jesus. Because, you see, when you decide that you are going to follow Jesus, you are stepping into a way of life that is Well, it's upside down compared to the way the world thinks. It's a way of life where the greatest is actually the least, where the last actually come first, and you find your life actually by losing it. I mean, even in our story today, yes, Jesus is being revealed here as our deliverer and our redeemer, but remember, always remember that he will deliver us by going to the cross for us. And he will redeem us by dying in our place there. It's upside down and inside out. And not everybody is going to get that. Very few people will, actually. And if you are only coming to Jesus because, you know, you've heard that he's a miracle worker and you're after some miracles of your own... If you're following him because you want greatness, let's say, the way the world defines greatness, or you want power, maybe, the way the world defines power, if that is what you are after, you are following the wrong Messiah. And you are going to be sadly disappointed when it's revealed to be true. And if you get that, Then think about it like this, keeping his messianic identity a secret like he does in Mark, well, it kind of serves as a filter, doesn't it? Filtering out anyone who is following Jesus for all the wrong reasons. And so long as it's kept secret, only those who really get what he's really about will really recognize him for who he is. That's my take on the messianic secret, anyways. I will let sharper tacks than I pin it down for sure. But whatever the reason for it, it is the case that in Mark's gospel, Jesus does not want his public, his, <coughs> does not want his identity as Lord to go public until he is good and ready to make it public. And whatever else is happening in Mark chapter 11, Jesus is now going public in the most powerful, the most controversial, and the most unmistakable way you could possibly imagine. Yes, chapters 1 to 10, there was hiding it because he wanted to keep it secret, because he wasn't yet ready to go public. But after this, after today, it will be out in the open at last and forever, Jesus is Lord. Do what you will with that truth, but you cannot keep it secret any longer. Of course, this is maybe a riskier thing for us than we might think. Letting the secret out of the bag, I mean, that Jesus is Lord. My my grandfather was in his 60s when he accepted that Jesus was Savior and received him as Lord. And I love my grandpa a lot. And I loved him even before he was a Christian. But I will say that in his pre-Christian days, my grandpa was rather notorious for being, well, let's call it a very aggressive, defensive driver. Okay? 
Sometimes he was so aggressive that he was more of an offensive driver, if you know what I mean. And if you don't know what I mean, then let me say that one of his favorite expressions while driving was, come on, buddy, drive it or park it. Although usually the other driver couldn't hear him say, drive it or park it. And so he would find other ways of communicating that message. Like driving up so close to the back of the bumper that the car in front of him would, you know, start to feel a little bit pressured. And then he would zip past at breakneck speeds and then he'd cut him off when he zipped back in for good measure. I'm, I'm exaggerating here. J- just a little bit. <laughs> but I will tell you this true story. One time... Someone was not letting him into the lane that he wanted to merge into, and when he could not take it anymore, he shouted out the window at him, you squirrel head, direct quote. And what made it so memorable was that that was the most G-rated thing any of us had ever heard him say to another motorist. Usually it was far more explicit than squirrel head. But like I say, My grandpa became a Christian much later in life. And he was on fire for the Lord when he came to Jesus. He got his Zondervan study Bible, and he started listening to his Gaither gospel music. And he got one of those fake brass ornaments that you put on bumper stickers in the shape of a fish to put on the back of his car which he proudly did, his brass fish on his bumper. And then one day my grandma said to him, (laughs) she said, you know, if you're going to put a fish ornament on the bumper of your car, you might want to give some thought as to how you are driving. My grandpa was like, what do you mean? (laughs) And grandma said, Well, I think if you're going to publicly display that your car is a Christian car, then you can't drive it like a pagan anymore. It's funny. It is funny, but it really impacted my grandpa, that thought. Seriously, I would get in the car with him after that, and he'd look at me, and he'd say something like, I have to drive like a Christian now, (laughs) because I got my fish bumper sticker. (laughs) And actually, he did make some major changes in the way he drove. At the very least, I never again ever heard him call anybody a squirrel head. So that's an improvement. But the point is, there is this thing that happens, isn't there? Or at least a thing that should happen when we go public with Jesus. I mean, unless we want people to think that the the shiny brass fish on the back of our bumper or whatever it happens to be, that, you know, it's just a big, empty show, unless we don't care if it looks hypocritical, shouldn't making it public that he is Lord also mean living in ways that shows it is true? That he is our Lord? I'm not sure, but I suspect that that is one of the reasons why that the same crowds who are crying out Hosanna to Jesus now as he rides his triumphant donkey into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, many of them will be the ones crying out, crucify him, crucify him on Good Friday, five days from now. Because it's one thing to publicly welcome your deliverer when you think that he has come to fulfill your agenda to set you free on your terms and to redeem you in the way that you think you should be redeemed. But it is a completely different thing, isn't it? To discover that going public with his identity as your savior also means accepting his claim over your life, right down to the way you're living it and what you're living there's a really old saying the saying goes that your character your character is who you are when nobody is watching but I gotta say I'm not entirely sure that's always true at least not when it comes to being a follower of Jesus because being a follower of Jesus is a public decision not a private decision 
and who you are as a follower of Jesus is determined as much by what you do when everybody's watching as it is by what you do when nobody's around. And if he really is Lord, Whippy Church, after today there can be no hiding it. And if that makes sense, then let me ask it here at the end. Is he your Lord today? Or are you trying to hide it? I realize that's a loaded question, but I think it is the question that we need to ask today. Because the thing is that after this triumphal entry today, everybody is gonna have to declare themselves one way or another, aren't they? Do they recognize Jesus' secret identity? And are they prepared to have him go public with it in their lives? Or do they not? And are they not? I remember when my wife and I, we were still kind of new to our faith, and I've shared this story before about how we got connected to a little country church in rural Alberta, just as we were starting out in our families and we were starting out in our careers, and that's how the Lord sort of brought us back to Him. And it was a season in our lives where it just sort of felt like every day we were waking up to more and more aspects of what it meant to truly let Jesus be the Lord of your life, and we were just on fire for Him. And Danny had read this book back then called The Case for Christ. Anybody? Okay, well, it came out about 20 years ago now, which will allow you to date this story, but, but it was super popular back then. It was kind of like a, a popular level apologetics book that sort of walked through some, some of Christianity's most basic beliefs about Jesus, his death, his resurrection, and, and it gives some sort of well, some historical and some philosophical reasons why those claims are true. And the book deeply impacted Danny, the time, the time when she read it. And then after the book, she got thinking about people in her life, like loved ones, I mean, and people in her family, right? People who probably did not know the very reasonable evidence that the book lays out for the reliability of the claims of Christ. And, and people in her family who maybe did not even know that she was a Christian. At least, she had never shared with them that she was, and certainly faith was never anything that ever came up in any of their conversations. And so Danny decided to go public, so to speak. She went to the Christian bookstore, and she bought about a dozen copies of The Case for Christ. And then she sat down and she wrote out a long letter in which she explained that she was a believer and why she was a believer and how she hoped that the people she loved also knew Jesus and loved him too. It was actually, it was a very beautiful letter and it was very sincere and also very public. And then she put a copy of the letter along with a copy of the case for Christ in a bunch of big orange envelopes. And she sent them all out to everyone on her list. I mean, pe people that she loved dearly. But she hadn't yet gone public with them about who was Lord of her life. You would be surprised how nervous she felt putting those letters in the mail. Although I should say, for true disclosures, she did not have any reason to be nervous. For the most part, everyone who received a letter responded to her with great love and appreciation and acceptance. But still, you would be surprised how hard it was to go public like that. Or maybe you wouldn't be surprised. Because this is often one of the most challenging things that Jesus calls us to do in our lives following him. And it is all kinds of likely that he has called you to go public with him at some point too. It's all kinds of likely that he's calling you today to go public in some way, in your workplace maybe, or your neighborhood, or among your family, among your friends, among your loved ones. I don't know. But I do know that Christians who take that step 
and come out into the open with Jesus, they usually find themselves stepping into all kinds of areas of growth and richness and intimacy in their relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It happens. Because if he really is Lord, that's something that you cannot keep hidden. I'm going to invite the worship team to come and help us to respond to what we've heard today. And as they find their place, let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for that moment we are celebrating today where you showed to the world who you really are. And we invite you to lead us this morning to respond in the way you would have us to respond. And if there is, Lord, a step of going public that you're prompting us to, let us not leave here without making a commitment in our hearts with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I just um, want to say a quick prayer to um, something that I always want to make sure happens on the Sundays when I am leading worship is that people know that this is a space where you can just come as yourself. There are no faces. You have to put on things that you need to do judgment that you have to fear because this is a space where it is us and him. He already knows who we are, so especially in this setting, why would you ever use the energy to try to be someone else? I pray that um, you guys can bow your head or just listen as I say this, but Heavenly Father, uh, I just pray that you would open up this space to reflect and to hear the cries of all of your children, Lord, young and old, um, new to this community, those who have been here for a long time, God, I pray that you would just help them to see that this is just a space for you and them. There's no judgment from you, and there's no judgment from their family. This community, this family is something that you built, and this is the best place that we can practice living in your vision and living the life, our lives, the way that you did. I pray that in this new year, almost three months and now, God, that you would just allow everyone who is struggling or who had the thought of 2024 is going to be my year and is not able to say that that's how it's been going, Lord, I pray that you would hold them and you would lift everything that they're putting on themselves, all the weight that they're putting on themselves, Lord, that you would just lift it off and remind them that they're not through this alone. Um, it can be so hard when you're in spaces like that to not to not go into this space of being by yourself and being isolated. God, I pray that um, just while we close with our two songs, you would just fill people with the calmness for being who they are with everything that they're struggling through. Pray this in your name. Amen. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song, this cornerstone. The solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand.
Christ alone took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless pain, this gift of love and righteousness, born by the ones he came to save, till on that Bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood. Commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand. Till he returns or calls me home, here in the power of Christ I'll stand. No power of Amen, Lord. We declare that you are truly worthy in this place. And we pray, Lord, that your spirit would bind these words to our heart as we sing them and allow us to sing from a place of true and deep relationship with you. Amen. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. And do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop, stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that you could see it all made new? We do. Is all creation groaning? It is. Is the new creation coming? It is. Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? It is. 
Is it good that we remind ourselves of this? It is. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the grave. Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Of all blessing and honor and glory, is he worthy of it? Does the Father truly love us? Does the Spirit move among us? He does. And does Jesus, our Messiah, forever those He loves? He does. Does a God intend to dwell again? Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Amen. As you go from here, please go with this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance to you and give you peace. And may the grace of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thank you for joining us for this Palm Sunday celebration. Head into Holy Week with great joy and anticipation.